Muslim. Ecology from Buddhist perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tenzin Silon, and uh, I am the lecturer of the Dalai Lama Institute of Higher Education, and I teach Buddhist uh, epistemologies and uh, psychologies uh, in my classroom. So today, I'm going to speak about the ecology from Buddhist perspective. So it is very true that, you know, when Buddha came into this planet, there was no uh, global warming, there was no climate change, there was no environmental issue. So, so when we speak a uh, connection between the ecology and Buddhist <coughs> perspective, I think we must first begin uh, with the Buddha's own life story. So if you look at the Buddha's own life story, in the beginning that you can see that, you know, Buddha was born under the Bodhi tree at Lumbini Gardens. You know, not in the palace, not in the cave. You know. And if you look at the middle of Buddha's life, you know, and uh, you can see again that, you know, Buddha, he has reached uh, his final stage of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya in Bihar, not in the palace not in the cave. Then if you look at the end of Buddha's life, then you can see again that, you know, Buddha passed away as a Parinirvana, you know, at the Kushinagar in Uttar Pradesh, not in the palace, not in the cave. So if you look at the Buddha's entire life, then you can see that, you know, Buddha has spent most of his life under the Bodhi tree, at the garden, in the forest, you know, in the open space. So that means that, you know, Buddha likes greenies, Buddha likes natures, Buddha likes open space, you know. So today, you can see, you know, you can see a green party across the globe, you know, across the globe. So today, if Buddha was alive, I think that you know he will definitely support to this party, or he may join to this party. And according to the Buddhist uh, Vinaya scriptures, Buddha has advised for the monks that you know monks are prohibited, you know, not to say, not to stay in a single uh, place permanently. They have to change their place from one place to the another place. When uh, monks, they are shifting from one place to the another place, at that time, you know, uh, at that time, you know, uh, monks, they have to give the full instruction to the monks who are the newcomer. So they have to give the full instructions how to take care of the environment that they have planted around. You know. So this is the indication of taking care of the environment that Buddha has advised for the monks. So if you look at the you know, rainy seasons, monks, you know, they are doing the practice of you know, summer retreat. And if you look at the summer retreat, you know, Buddha has created a six kind of perceptions. Among them, the three perceptions, which is related to do the practice of protecting environment and nurturing the environment. So first, you know, perception is Buddha has said, to the monks that monks are prohibited when they are passing through the uh, farmland, they should not cut off the field, you know. The second perception, uh, second perception is that, you know, monks, 
they are not allowed to cut the living things. So they are not allowed to cut the trees, leaves, and plants, you know. And third one is, you know, Buddha has advised that monks are prohibited to take the earth, you know, uh, uh, without any necessary. So these are the perceptions that Buddha have, you know, Buddha has created for the monks to nurturing the environment, to do the practice of protecting, you know, environment. So if we look at the Buddhist, you know, uh, uh, Buddhist perspective, then you can see that, you know, Buddha has taught that everything is interconnected. Buddha has taught the concept of interdependence. So when we speak about the concept of interdependence, then you can see there is a one popular sutra, which is called the Patitya Samuttapata. Patitya Samuttapata Sutra, Buddha has said that, you know, if this exists, this will come to exist. Because this has arisen, this will arise. Through the influence of ignorance, the compositional processes come into the beings, you know. So that means that everything is interconnected. Everything is depending to each other. So, now, uh, there are some Tibetan scripture, it has written that, you know, uh, birds, animals, trees, environments, they are all, you know, uh, they are all the beauty of nature. They are all the ornament of the natures. Okay, so we don't know anything about the ornament of the nature. We don't know anything about the nature and you know, the beauty of nature. Today, we are living in a big cities. We are living in a good infrastructure. We are living in a big building. We are living in you know, a tall building, nice building. We don't know anything about the beauty of nature. So one day, if you go to the countryside, you, if you spend one night there, you can see the next morning, you can see that the birds are singing sweetly early in the morning. You can take a very good, you know, fresh air. Then you will definitely feel that you are very much part of the nature. You will definitely feel that, you know, you are very fresh and you will definitely feel that you are calm and you are peaceful, you know. So when we speak about the beauty of nature, you know, I always have a question in my mind that, you know, what do you think that, you know, what do you, what about the mosquitoes? What do you think that, do you think that, you know, mosquito is the, you know, beauty of nature? So there is a story between the mosquitoes and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> his Holiness the Dalai Lama, one time he visited to the Oxford University and he was interacting with the scientist and he was interacting with the great professor at the university. At that time he was, you know, he openly and publicly asked He asked that, you know, he said that, you know, sometimes when he feels, you know, happy, when he is in good mood, when he is aware of there is no malaria epidemic, you know, around this place, then sometimes he donates his blood to the mosquitoes, you know. And he has noticed that, you know, uh, mosquitoes, they are enjoying the blood and they are dropping some bubbles on the surface of the skin. Then they just fly away. So he noticed that, you know, mosquitoes, they are not able to show the sense of appreciation, you know, of others' good thing. So this is what his holiness Dalai Lama asked that, you know, you know, is there anybody who can give the answer that in the brain size, which level has an ability to show the sense of appreciation? There was no scientist who was able to give the answer of his question, you know. So when we, um, when we speak about the concept of interdependence, that means, you know, there is a balance between we human beings and animals, trees, birds, you know, there is a bonding between us. So today we are disturbing this balance and we are destroying this bonding. Today we human beings, we are killing the animals and we are eating the animals. 
Uh, no. And let me give you an example, you know. There are so many species, you know. Their population is under the threat of extinction. Recently, I watched the documentary. It is the BBC documentary. It has shown about the tiger. The tiger population across the globe is all, only the thousand, you know, three thousands. Only the three thousands. So the tiger population is you know, under the danger of extinction. In terms of, you know, in terms of, you know, killing animals, in terms of uh, eating meat, Buddha did not talk much about the restriction, you know. Buddha did not talk much restrictions about, you know, taking the meat, you know. Especially Buddha did not advise for the monks, you know, monks are not allowed to, you know, take the uh, meat because, you know, not only at the Buddha's lifetime, even today, if you go to the you know Theravada countries such as you know Burma, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, you can see that monks, you know, they don't have a private kitchen. They are not arranging the food by themselves. You know, they are going for arm. They are going to bag the foods. You know, so monks, they are not in the position to demand that, you know, I want this food and I want that food, you know. Monks are not positioned, in, not positioned to demand, I want this food and that food. This is their practice, and the purpose of this practice is to reduce their attachment towards foods and shelter. Okay, so when, when we speak about, you know, uh, the taking meat, you know, so, Buddha uh, did not give so much uh, restrictions toward the meats when he was in India because India has a strong tradition to do the practice of vegetarians. And not only at the Buddha's lifetime, you know, even today, I give you an example that, you know, a couple of years ago, in 2018, there was a one Hindu great festival called the Mahakumbh Mela. It was hosted in Allahabad and 120 million Hindu pilgrims, they have gathered on the bank of River Ganga. 120 million people, can you imagine? We Tibetan only have a six million people. So 120 million Hindu pilgrims, they have gathered there. They are, you know, uh, they are highly and strictly enjoying the practice of vegetarian. So therefore, it has reported that, you know, there was no single life of animal was killed and harmed. So this is fascinating, you know. His Holiness Dalai Lama always asking to Tibetan that we must learn this from Indian tradition. So as a, you know, follower of the Buddha, as the, as the Buddhist uh, practitioner, I would like to suggest you that when you are doing the pilgrimage, you know, uh, uh, pilgrimage to the Buddhist holy sites or when you are attending to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teaching, it would be nice if you can do the practice of vegetarian. So Buddha did not talk much about the uh, restrictions toward the meats you know, when he was in India. But Buddha, Buddha have gave some restrictions to the certain type of meat which is called the miksha in Tibetan term. Miksha here, miksha, miksha means, you know, uh, the meat that is specially killed for you. So monks are not allowed to accept, you know, that kind of meat which is specially killed for you. And he has here, he has, he has mentioned that thopa. Thopa means, you know, suspicious. Even monks, they feel a small suspicious that, you know, that particular meat is specially killed for you, then you are not allowed to accept that meat, you know. Then, you know, when Buddha visited to the Sri Lanka, you know, Buddha visited to the Lanka, at that time, he has noticed that, you know, people of Lanka, they are enjoying meat too much. They are enjoying non-vegetarian too much. Then Buddha has said, when he was addressing to the public, at that time Buddha said that, you know, if you are my follower, you should not accept any kind of meat. This is what Buddha has said. So there is a, you know, beautiful writing. 
There is a beautiful writing it has written by one of the Tibetan scholar. His name is Gishe Langri Thambat. And uh, his uh, textbook is called the, you know, Lojong Tsikema, The Eight Verses on Mind Training. In that, you know, textbooks, in a second verse, he has said that That means, you know, when you are interacting, you know, whoever you are interacting uh, to another, you know, you must uh, feel yourself as the lowest among them. You should not feel that you are as, you know, you are as a superior. If you feel that you are superior, that you, then you are not able to develop the sense of respect towards others and sense of respect toward the environment. So you have to view yourself as the lowest. If you feel that, then you would be able to develop the sense of respect to the people and sense of respect towards the environment. This is what he has said. Thank you.